So let's talk about risk analysis. What are our objectives today? Our objectives are to explain the fundamental concepts of risk analysis and describe the different approaches, explain the process of risk analysis, and to describe the techniques to minimize risk. Uh, by the way, I'm a certified information system security professional, which is a professional certification for security professionals. And uh, if you do decide to get this uh, certification, which is a, which is a good thing, it, it shows you that you've gone above and beyond um, your your current level and actually worked um, a little bit more to uh, to kind of broaden your your understanding of the technical aspects and non-technical aspects of uh, security administration. Is that a lot of um, some of the material that will be covered involves risk analysis. So when you go for these other certifications which can lead to better jobs or more pay. Some of them are um, cover non-technical and technical information, and others are purely technical. And so the CISSP is uh, one that covers, it's a very broad uh, coverage of topics, and risk analysis is a very important topic uh, within that certification. Okay, let's start out by talking about the fundamental concepts of risk analysis. Security, first of all, you need to know is not perfect. Security is not an end state. You never are able to say, wow, I've got a secure network, or I have a secure computer, or if I have a secure house. Because given enough time and effort and money, somebody can break into your network and somebody can break into your computer. And we'll talk about the ways that that occurs later on. Some of these could be just as simple as paying a janitor to take off the sticky notes that uh, they find around or to, or to write down the information they see on the sticky notes that are posted on various uh, um, monitors or underneath keyboards and, um, and given to somebody externally so they've got the user's um, passwords. And so security is not an end state but it's a process. And so you need to be continually updating and assessing the risk involved with the way you're doing things and th this is um, essentially what we do in a risk analysis. It determines the threats that face the organization. And risk analysis is not necessarily dealing with network security, let's say from an attacker um, trying to um, attack your network, but it even has to do with such things as, um, let's say, uh, lightning hits your building, and if you don't have appropriate uh, UPS devices, that it blows out your network. So that has the same effect of bringing down your network and perhaps destroying your data as somebody blowing up the building in which your data resides or a flood coming in and washing it all away like it did with Katrina in uh, New Orleans or somebody breaking in from the outside into your network and destroying the data. And so what a risk analysis does, it looks at all the various risks that, um, that could be applicable to your organization. Uh, another term, security policy. Why are security policies important? Well, secu security policies are essentially rules and guidelines um, involving the very security aspects of your organization, and that involves computer security, network security, um, physical security, application security, and operational security. And those are topics that are all covered in the CISSP. Security policies are important because they stipulate how you should be securing your infrastructure, physical, network, computer, and otherwise. Uh, security policies are statements that spell out what defenses should be configured, how the organization will respond to attacks, and how employees should safely handle the organization's resources. And typically, for most uh, organizations now, their greatest resource is their data. If you think about banks, Banks essentially hold information. I mean, they. Some people may have, you know, um, um, safety deposit boxes there. But essentially, what we're doing is, is we're protecting the organization's resources, which are usually data. The process of risk analysis is, um, if we look at this right here, um, we first perform a risk analysis to determine what types of risks an organization is susceptible to. Once we do that, we can define our security policy that defines how we're going to cover these risks. And in some instances, you'll see that 
some risks we may just want to accept. For example, um, let's say the threat of a, uh, let me think of something really silly that's, that could actually happen. Uh, in Arizona, a flood, okay, if, if you're in New Orleans or if you're in Miami, there's a possibility of a hurricane, well, <laughs> not in Arizona, but in, in Miami, a hurricane coming and the storm surge flooding through a bank. And so that may be something that we want to protect against either through insurance or through building some type of barrier so the flood couldn't occur. We could say the same thing for a bank in Arizona. A hurricane wouldn't hit, but you could have a large storm, let's say the storm of the century that flooded a particular area, but it may happen once every, like I said, 100 years. So that may be what we would call an acceptable risk. And so we say, okay, we're not gonna uh, build um, build any barriers to the bank or insure against it because we don't we believe there's a small probability of that occurring okay so with a security policy we define what we're going to secure and how and then we implement that security policy through various means and um, um, this could include as I said insurance or uh, creating new network um, infrastructures such as firewalls or intrusion detection systems or new policies for access controls. And the next element for that is enforcement and monitoring, is that we have to constantly monitor what's going on in our organization to make sure that, that, um, that our policies are acceptable, that, that they're being implemented appropriately. Now what happens is that on, um, on an occasion, the environment changes. Um, for one reason or another. New employees come in, uh, you may get some uh, new contracts, let's say that uh, new contractors are coming in and before you didn't have any contractors. And so we have to look at those environmental changes, perform another risk analysis and determine, let's say for these new contractors, how are we going to deal with them? Based upon that risk analysis, then we, then we go back and we change our security policy. We implement those changes. And as you see right here, the policy changes. And, um, and then go back to enforcing and monitoring. So remember, this is a process. This is part of security administration. It's a process, not an end state. So what are some of the risk analysis factors? Risk is defined as the possibility of damage or loss to some of our resources. And what a risk analysis does is we study the likelihood of the damage or loss, and likelihood can be expressed um, uh, in numbers, for example, the probability of something occurring. If you look at insurance companies, they actually have data on the probability of things occurring. For example, the, po the probability of it flooding in a particular area, the probability of, of a, a riot occurring, or the probability of somebody, um, an, an arsonist uh, burning up a building, and so on. And when we're looking at um, the risk analysis, we have to, to look at all the different tools, all the different resources that are part of our in infrastructure. So we need to think about hardware as well as the software and any data warehouses that, um, that store our data. We also need to define our assets. What are the kinds of things that we want to protect? And those can be broken down into four different categories, physical assets, data assets, application software assets, and personnel assets. If you think about it, for most organizations, their number one cost is in personnel. And uh, without the personnel who are trained, wh where we've spent thousands of dollars uh, training individual personnel and bringing them in and paying them, is that we need to, to consider that personnel are a very, very important resource. And in some, some cases, they're uh, um, they're the most important resource. Another term we need to be con uh, cognizant of is threats. A threat is an event that has not occurred but might occur. And so let's think about just for a second what are some examples of threats, potential threats. Okay, what did you come up with? Let's think about this. Fire. Um, something catching on fire. I mean, it could be the building catching on fire for various reasons. A lightning strike. Uh, within your network 
uh, some piece of equipment could overheat and start a fire in your server room. Um, flooding, as we talked about before, or let's say in the server room, um, if you've got uh, fire suppressant devices, um, one of the things that you shouldn't have is uh, water as a fire suppressant device in your server room. So if you weren't that bright and you put um, um, water as a fire suppressant, that could actually be a threat to your data. Um, and of course, network attacks from the outside as well as the inside. And so you could come up with lots of different types of threats and those all need to be considered in the risk analysis. So the potential for a threat that is a probability greater than zero, even it could be one in a billion, poses a risk, no matter, you know, large risk or small risk to your organization's assets. And so a threat can be universal or it could be specific to your system. So an earthquake or a flood or a hurricane or anything like that may be considered universal. However, let's say a worm, a new worm uh, that comes out could be specific to, let's say, your Windows boxes. Um, and so circumstance specific threat examples include the power supplies going out, uh, the crime rate in a neighborhood where your data is stored or your operations are uh, run out of, could be facility rated or industry related. So the seriousness of a threat depends on the probability that it will occur. And recall that probabilities um, go from uh, zero to one inclusive. And so the, the closer to one, the higher the probability that an event will occur. I'm sure you all know that. Probabilities are factors that affect the probability that a threat will actually occur include the geographic region in which your, um, your operations are run or your data is stored. So. For example, a hurricane in West Palm Beach has a higher probability of occurring than does one in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. The physical location and the, um, I'm not sure what it means by habitual. We'll have to look that up. Never seen that term used in this context. Okay, there's also the, another term that we use in risk analysis and that in, that's uh, exposure. And the exposure increases if you have factors that increase the the threat probabilities. And, um, and so the higher this is, the probability that an event occurs, the higher the exposure factor. So one of the first things we do is when we start a risk analysis is that we do the following. We list our assets. What are all the different assets? Physical assets, data assets, application, software, and personnel assets. And then the threats for each of these assets. Typically, as assistant administrator, um, you might only be dealing with these things. Although, if you're in charge of all the security, you should be aware that you need to consider all these. Then we list all the threats associated with each of those assets. And then we define the probabilities, that is the exposure, to each of these. And so here's a very simple matrix that indicates um, sample threat probabilities. And notice that these can be in number or they, they can be in words. And sometimes, it, unless you have real hard data on a probability, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, what's the probability of, say, uh, let me see, um, employees giving out information? Well, there's a 0 0.01 probability. Well, how do you know that? Unless you have prior data or prior facts where you can actually uh, extrapolate a probability, it doesn't really make sense to give a hard specific number and that's when uh, terms like medium low very high and high come in so the probability of an earthquake we may say is only medium now what does that mean in terms of probabilities well that's kind of a, a fuzzy concept the word medium however by contacting an insurance company we could see for example that the probability of an earthquake in let's say this is San Francisco may be medium which would amount to 0.1, um, a probability of 1 in 100 occurring each year, although that wouldn't be medium, that might be considered low. So you might consider the probability of a fire being low, of a flood being high, attack from the internet being very high, and virus infection very high. And we can get some of these numbers uh, not only from insurance companies, but also just by looking at the uh, 
uh, going out to CERT, Commuter Emergency Response Team at Carnegie Mellon, and seeing uh, how many attacks from the internet are occurring on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis, as well as um, the viruses that are out there and how virulent they are. Um, if we look at this, probability of a flood is high. That kind of tells you where whatever this is, whatever organization this is talking about might be located. Or employees giving out information. If we're talking about a military installation, we we'll probably consider that to be very low because these people have security clearances. However, if it's somebody working at, let's say, a fast food restaurant, not that they have any um, like critical data, but that might be um, higher. Now, another term we need to be familiar with is vulnerability. Situations or conditions that increase a threat probability, which in turn increases risk. And so a vulnerability might be, let's say, well, here's some examples down here. OS flaws. So um, an operating system flaw, for example, buffer overflows, uh, excuse me, from per poorly written software, application software flaws also are susceptible. Applications are susceptible to buffer overflows, poorly configured firewalls or packet filters, unprotected passwords. Um, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, unpro yeah, okay. Unprotected passwords and log files and wireless networks all are vulnerabilities. That is, they increase the probability of an attack, occur of a threat. And so uh, that's, of course, and we know that what some of the uh, controls for these are. That's another term that we'll come up shortly, but controls for operating system flaws are patches. Application software control for that are patches. Poorly configured firewalls, um, a control for that is, is um, the maintenance of your firewalls to, to make sure that they're up to date and reliable. Unprotected passwords and log files are to make sure you have access controls on the files that contain the, uh, the logs and the passwords. And wireless networks, a control for that is not even to allow them within a network. Or if they are allowed, uh, make sure that they are isolated in some manner from our, uh, from our data infrastructure networks. Okay, now we also need to consider the consequences of if something happens. For example, let me flip back here for a second. Oops, where did I mention here's the earthquakes? Oh, there. Okay, the impact. What if a fire occurs? If, what if it's a small fire in somebody's office? The probability is low. The consequences of that might be low. Uh, and so that might not be that big a problem. However, an earthquake, an earthquake is going to shake the building. Um, it could destroy everything within the building, bring the entire building down. And so, so the consequences of that could be extremely high. The consequences of an attack from the internet while the probability could be very high, the consequences could be very high, or they could be very low. So what the consequences are, are an indication of the significance of an attack, its impact upon the organization. So some consequences can be estimated. Uh, and usually with respect to the consequences, if we can actually define a dollar amount, it's best. But once again, that can be very difficult to do unless you use uh, insurance company figures or figures from an organizations, similar organizations that have similar types of um, attacks. And some consequences are difficult to anticipate. So um, I'm trying to think of an example quickly. But there's always, if, if, you, were, if you know just in your daily lives that if something comes up and you think, wow, I never realized that that would happen, uh, that's the kind of thing it's talking about here. Okay, return on investment helps you calculate your losses after an attack. And so you can what what essentially what this is saying is is that what we're going to do is the organization is going to do or use a security administrator for an organization is to say, okay, there's a possibility of something occurring to let's say our network. And so the threat of somebody attacking our network. So what are we going to do to protect ourselves from that attack? Well, let's put a firewall outside of the network so anything coming in has to get by the firewall. Well, the firewall costs money. And so what you have to do is your return on investment is comparing the cost of the firewall against the possible consequences of somebody breaking into your network without the firewall to determine um, what your return on investment is. How much are you actually saving 
by, by purchasing that firewall. It, realize that there's different cost of firewalls. You can actually get an, uh, an old box and put Linux on it and, and use IP tables to create the firewall all up and or you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars for a Cisco PIX firewall. It's a security measure so you have to look at the return on investment of various types of controls whether a Linux box or a Cisco PIX and the probability of somebody getting through those firewalls and what the consequences might be for your network. Notice that security measures cost should always be less than your losses. Let's say if you spent a million dollars, let me see, a uh, million dollars on some particular type of control for a network, however your potential losses are only ten thousand dollars, that makes absolutely no sense to, to pay a million dollars for that control. So it's, it's, if your potential losses are ten thousand dollars, then your control should be ten thousand dollars or less. That should make sense. Okay, now we have a matrix indicating the threat, the probability of that threat, and the consequences. So this has a medium probability, the earthquake. Consequences are significant. And therefore, if we look at these two, let's just compare these two right here. And these, well, let's just do, do these two first. Here's an earthquake and a fire. The, the probability of an earthquake is medium, of a fire is low, but each has significant consequences. Which are we going to spend more money on? protecting against an earthquake or a fire? Well, we're more likely to spend more money on protecting against an earthquake because the probability of that is higher. Okay, let me see. Let's, um, okay, so let's compare these two down here. Attack from the internet and virus infection. Very high and very high probability. Consequences are both serious, and so essentially these are equal. So whatever control we have that we're going to uh, purchase or implement. Um, we're going to want to. They're going to be about the same in terms of cost. Okay, safeguards. Okay, this is another term. Um, the CISSP uses the term controls. Uh, this author is using the term safeguards, and it's the same exact thing. So, a safeguard is a measure you can take to reduce a threat. And so some of the examples of, um, of these are firewalls and intrusion detection systems, locking doors using passwords, and using encryption. Think about some of the others just for a second. Key cards, badges, what else? Fire suppressant devices, can you think of anything else? Insurance. Insurance is a safeguard. Is it what you're actually doing is, is you're transferring um, the possible consequences to somebody else because you'll be repaid um, for any losses. <clears throat> Another term is residual risk, and that's what is left over after countermeasures and defenses are limited or excuse me, implemented, because there's no countermeasure or defense that is perfect. Okay, so all these terms are actually the same. Making sh let's make sure that we understand our terminology. A control is the same thing as a safeguard, is the same thing as a countermeasure, is the same thing as defense. Those essentially mean the same thing. Control, safeguards, and countermeasures are the same thing. Okay, here we have a graph here that's, um, that's graphing risk to assets versus threats. And so notice that this probability here is zero, and so if there's zero probability of, of a threat, there's no risks to our asset. However, as the probability of threats increase, there's a greater risk to our assets. And so once we see here, as the threats are increasing more and more, there's risk to our assets. However, once we apply our countermeasures, that reduces our risks, because we're actually defending our infrastructure. But notice that this never goes to zero because there's always going to be some residual risk because um, there's no way to, to have 100% security. Threat and risk assessment approaches um, risk analysis from the standpoint of threats and risk to an organization's assets. And the steps are essentially, what I've done is I've gotten a little ahead of myself, is I've already explained what we need to do here for a threat and risk assessment. We need to first 
to uh, define our assets, which we did before. Let's flip back here. You know, it's probably annoying, but you know, what, what the heck. Here's our assets, physical, data, application, software, and personnel. We need our threat assessment is to identify the threats for each of those assets. Then our risk assessment is to determine um, the probability and significance of these threats. And finally, the recommendations, and the recommendations are going to be in terms of our countermeasures and controls for each of these threats. Not only are we going to have to define the countermeasures, but also how much we're going to spend on them. Okay, here's our threat rating system. Notice it's still not using uh, probabilities. They res um, range from negligible to extreme. Uh, that's kind of funny that, that the earthquake's likely to occur every six months or less. That's what they had on the previous one. That's I'm not sure where that occurs. I guess you have uh, small earthquakes in California all the time. Uh, very high, likely to occur multiple times per month or less. That's what they had indicated for the uh, network attacks. An extreme, likely to occur multiple times each day. Okay, here are consequences. Catastrophic threatens the continuation of the program and well is causing major problems for customers. Major threatens the continuation of basic functions of the program or project and requires senior level management intervention all the way down to insignificant. That is, can be dealt with by normal operations. You know, and for, and for each of these, um, you know, you can spend a lot of money doing a threat and risk assessment. So s another way of doing this outside of just using words to define describing consequences, but also to define a dollar value on a loss. For example, if you um, if a fire starts in your server room and all your data uh, is obliterated in the fire, you can actually try to come up with a dollar figure of the loss. But that's very, very difficult to do. Realize that risk analysis is an ongoing process. It's not a one-time activity. You need to do this on a regular basis. Um, realize your initial risk analysis is used to formulate a security policy and then once you get your security policy recall that you implement that and then you enforce it and monitor it and then as um, as your organization grows as things change you need to update your security policy to reflect the fact that your organization has changed also realize that new threats and new intrusions can create the need for a reassessment of the risk and so how often do you do a risk assessment? Well, it depends on how volatile and how dynamic your uh, environment is. So risk analysis is a group of related activities that follow a sequence. We've kind of looked at that at a global view before. The sequence of activities are holding initial team sessions, conducting assets valuation, evaluating vulnerability, and calculating risk. Some of the things are not covered in, um, in the slides are the fact that um, you need to sell security at the very top level of management because if just the security administrators are the ones that are working with security, you, it's not going to be the most effective. Upper level management, hopefully the highest level of management, buys into the fact that security is critical to the organization. And once you do that, then everything else everybody else must follow because if the leader says hey security is important then everybody else is more likely to be on board so when we're talking about holding initial team sessions you're not talking about um, the, the head of security uh, this head systems administrator let's say and the other system administrators or network administrators and their team holding team sessions there should also be users regular users uh, hopefully some from each department that has uh, assets involved in the risk assessment as well as managers and of course that because they are the individual people and the managers and departments have the best knowledge of their assets valuation that should make clear sense and then you can evaluate the vulnerabilities and calculating the risk but realize that this is best done as a team working together then you can analyze your economic impacts to your organization 
estimate the financial impact or losses as I indicated before. You can use statistical models to do this, and there's also software that allows you to do this. It's kind of expensive, but if you're talking about doing something like this for a bank or for a major organization, it makes sense to buy the software. The basic information to estimate is the likely cost, and um, you can actually put um, you know, confidence intervals around that, so it's, a, you know, it's so much $10,000 to $50,000. It might not make sense to just talk about a single figure. You can also do things called Monte Carlo simulations, which just simulate real life systems by randomly generating values for variables. And then how do you manage risk? Remember, we, can't, we can reduce risk, we can manage rents, risk, but we can't completely obliterate it. Risk management is the process of identifying, choosing, and setting up countermeasures justified by the risks that you have identified. And the countermeasures are the things that go into your security policy. So things from a technical point of view that we think about all the time as countermeasures are what? I've already mentioned some of them. Think about it just for a few seconds. Firewalls, intrusion detection systems, what else? Encryption, access controls for particular files, even physical access. For example, your server should never be sitting out in the middle of a, of a room that, pe that everybody has access to. They should be physically secured. Fire suppression, anything else? There's plenty of others. Why don't you think about that? Securing hardware. Think about obvious kinds of physical protection, just what I talked about. Think about the environmental conditions within your, um, within your organization. You should lock up your hardware. Decide which devices you want to be, to be locked up. Um, something that's, that's being um, a problem now in organizations is the loss of data. Is It's very easy let's say, to take your data with you and uh, sell it to somebody else. And so one of the ways that, that can be protected is, for example, to have an intrusion detection system that looks for, let's say, particular keywords um, as information is, is uh, going outside of the network. But one of the problems also is, um, by the way, that would be very difficult to do, um, is um, thumb drives is that you can walk in and take a one gigabyte thumb drive, compress a ton of files and stick it on a thumb drive and walk out and no one would be the wiser. And so what a lot of companies, some companies are doing now are actually um, are taking out the USB uh, receptacles or even gluing them shut so that somebody can't stick a USB thumb drive um, and take away the information. Also, laptops is that people want to be able to take their work home or work while they're on the road. Laptops can be stolen or can be lost. And so the key thing to do here with, um, with laptops is to make sure that the hard drive is encrypted and that good passwords are used. And so that should be part of your security policy is the fact that, all, that um, they should all be set up with, um, with um, some sort of encryption. Install startup passwords and screen savers so that somebody can't get easy access to the laptop or the, um, or the account on a uh, workstation. And also make sure you encrypt files with programs such as PGP, which is a commercial program right now, but there's plenty of other uh, programs that are available such as the uh, free and open source GPG, which is something we'll talk about later. You'll get to use it. You need to conduct a hardware inventory uh, to make a list of servers, routers, cables, computers, printers, and other hardware because you need to know that if there's a fire and everything's obliterated, what have you lost? And so each of those things um, is an expensive asset outside of the cables, but if you lose enough cables, you know, that's, that can add up to a lot of money. Because I know in our research lab we get a lot of money spent on cables. And so that needs to be part of your risk assessment. Be sure to include your company's network assets, the things that you really don't get to see, um, but which um, 
they're not obvious right in front of you, but you need to know that um, those should be including in your risk assessment. And make a topology map of your network. This is showing a network topology for a particular network. Um, as you see here, we have one network over here, one over here, and one over here. This goes out to our internet service provider. Uh, notice there's a VPN between our branch office here. Here, this is going to be in your demilitarized zone, or it should be. This is our, our, our internet access, is through here. Um, if, if, if I'm looking at this correctly, this looks like a dual home host firewall where you have uh, a network interface card on the outside and then one going to the inside. And um, what this does is it allows you to kind of filter the packets that are going through to determine where you want to uh, forward the packets to. And simply what this is showing is, is that this is a, um, a network topology map. Now you can rank your resources to be protected, and this is fairly easy to do because if we take the probability of an event occurring multiplied by the consequences, that tells you which should be ranked highest and which should be ranked lowest. And so you can rank things in order of importance. Uh, values can be arbitrary numbers, but boy, it's not good to use arbitrary numbers. But you could, um, if we look at the terms of the the threat, um, the potential threat, which is the probability, and multiply that by the consequences, that tells you the importance of that asset. So we want to focus on the security assets, efforts of the most critical resources first, and then work in cooperation with your team and higher management to make sure that there's countermeasures. Uh, to limit the um, to limit the damage to these assets. Okay, securing information, security. Excuse me, securing information. We have electronic assets, word processing, spreadsheets, web pages, and so on. We also have logical assets, email messages. Uh, instant messaging conversations and log files, and then we have data assets, personnel records, customer information, and financial information. And we want to make sure that we uh, consider all of these when we consider countermeasures to protect these. Something that's critically important now is maintaining customer and employee privacy. Is um, especially if we're talking about critical information such as uh, personal information, um, banking information, financial information, health information. Uh, we want to make sure that this is isolated from the internet. We don't want this information sitting out on a demilitarized zone. We want to make sure that we have effective countermeasures including multiple layers of defenses to make sure that there's n very, very, very small chance that anyone could ever get this information. We also want to make sure that we have backup. This is oh, this is something I haven't really even talked about. Backup software to save critical files is, um, you know, you may lose the hard drive, you may lose the computer, but you if you only have one copy of your data, then you are really having a problem. You're having a bad day, and so um, if your if your assets are primarily information um, related, you want to make sure that you back up your soft back up your uh, data files and you want to back up back them up to a place which is protected um, from some of the threats and that's why now they have uh, data warehousing off-site uh, companies do that in fact there's some that actually put these uh, inside inside mountains in vaults so that even if there's an earthquake or um, God even a nuclear explosion all that information is protected other measures uh, to be used for computer and employee privacy include encryption, message filtering, data encapsulation, redundancy, and backups, as I just noted. Protecting corporate information includes never leaving company-owned laptops unattended, and if they do have, if your uh, people do use laptops, make sure that that information is encrypted. Password protect all job records and customer information and restrict personnel information to human resources staff and or upper management. This is all dealing with access control when we talk about restricting access. 
and that's something that we'll talk about later. And that's available with all the different operating systems is to determine who has access to what. Okay, conducting a routine analysis. Remember that risk analysis is an ongoing process, and so the company's as the company situation changes, you have to continually um, refocus on your efforts to determine what kinds of possible new th threats and consequences are out there. And uh, the risk analysis should be done routinely. Consider how often a risk analysis will be need to be performed and who will conduct the analysis. And do all hardware and software resources need to be reviewed every time? Maybe they do and maybe they don't. That's up to the, uh, depends on the organization. Human emotions can influence risk evaluations. Um, some companies do not allow these calculations to be done manually because the person who's in charge of a particular department will believe that, that theirs is the most important department and theirs are the most important assets, which means that they want more of the money for the, for, that's available for countermeasures. And therefore, some companies do not allow these calculations to be done manually, but um, they can be done um, either through outside resources, somebody actually coming in to perform the risk analysis, or through software, as we discussed before. Okay, security's not perfect. And so what, hap what do we do when something happens? We need to, um, to be prepared for the worst. A security incident, incident is when the worst happens and um, somebody breaks into the network, uh, a fire started, employee steals information, and somebody steals the laptop, and so on. You should have a a, an incident response plan to indicate what should be done should something happen. Um, and these should be predefined because you don't want, when something really bad happens, you don't want 10 people trying to figure out what should be done at that moment because there's a lot of motions involved. And so these things should be laid out a priori. They should be written down so when something does happen, you can go to the security plan, look at the incident response plan for that particular type of incident, and determine the steps that need to be taken. Okay, describe the kinds of incidents to be addressed, the alarm sent by intrusion detection systems, repeated unsuccessful logon attempts, unexplained changes to data or deletion records, systems crashes, poor systems performance. These are all technical incidents. And these are the kind of things actually, or the kinds of things that you will be most likely be involved with as IT personnel, but realize there's other types of incidents that need to be considered as well, such as a fire or an earthquake and so on. Here's an example of a sample incident handling form. And you can read that in the notes. You also want to have an incident response team. So um, you can develop a security incident response team that, um, that is supposed to be notified should an incident occur. Staff people designated the security incident response team is composed of staff designated to take countermeasures when an incident is reported. And it contains, and notice this, that how multidisciplinary this is. IT operations, technical support, application staff, the chief security officer, if you're talking about larger organizations, and information security specialists. So if you work in a larger organization, you're more likely to have one of these teams. Regardless, even if you're working in a small organization, you should try to have the appropriate staff involved with this. You don't want to be doing this by yourself. And so we can also indicate escalation procedures. Uh, these are a set of rules, roles, responsibilities, and measures taken in response to a security incident. So if we're talking about the role is that somebody who is, let's say, the IT operations and technical support staff has a particular role should something occur. Let's say the network goes down. What, are, what is the IT operations and technical support staff supposed to do? They have a particular responsibility and to provide certain measures in response to a security incident. Worst case scenarios. Uh, worst case scenarios are, um, these are like what if scenarios that describe the worst consequences toward an organization if a threat happens. 
Although the probability of this occurring may be highly unlikely, it's still good to kind of consider the things that you might need to do should the worst happen. And so what this essentially does is if this is written out beforehand, if you say, what's the worst thing can happen to our network? And then you can have an incident response plan that prepares you should that worst case scenario actually occur. Okay, the summary, you can take a look at this and read this yourself. We've gone over uh, a high level overview of risk analysis. Uh, there's tons and tons of books on risk analysis. If you, um, if you do the CISSP, if you get a book about that, there's going to be a really good chapter on risk analysis. It's good to be familiar with risk analysis and to understand it because in larger organizations, you're probably going to be involved in it. And in smaller organizations, it, it should be something where if, um, if your organization doesn't already do a risk analysis, it's something you would want to mention to managers because it, it would be your responsibility as a professional to actually bring that to their attention. Okay, that ends this class. Our next class will involve um, um, our next chapter, which is, I believe, chapter three. So go ahead and read that, and we'll start talking about technical things next time.